Hello, everyone. Welcome to another um, exciting meetup in Systems at Play. Wherever you are in the world, we have folks from Europe, US, Australia. I don't know, do we have folks from other countries, other places in the world? Apart from Europe and US and Australia? No. Looks like it. Looks like it. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, <laughs> uh, wherever you are. Um, Dave, I'll hand over to you, mate, if you want to kind of start the get yeah, us sure. started. Yeah. No worries. Uh, thanks, Ali, Dad. So um, thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, really great to uh, have Andrew uh, with us today, uh, taking us through um, creating breakthrough performance, uh, becoming more strategic and aligning organizations, creating more purpose-driven uh, peak performance culture and transforming our ways of working to be um, create workplaces which are joyful and creative. Hopefully we get all of that done in, in, in one night. We'll see how we go, Andrew. Um, if you're, you're here and you're here to see Andrew, you're in the right space, so well done. Um, systems at Play, it's been around for a little while now, uh, about two and a half years. Um, and uh, we're working with some new members all the time. We're now at, at over 370 members of the meetup group across six continents, probably more than 21 countries now or 48 cities. So we'll have to update our, 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 um, our information. So thanks for everybody for joining. Um, uh, why systems at play? Uh, well, we, we started this off to actually out of two reasons. One, because uh, in response to a reductionist ways of thinking being the dominant and quite often only ways of thinking that we saw. Um, and the difficulty of understanding the deep and vast ocean that there is of systems thinking. So it's been about us learning to a degree and building this community up. But uh, in conversations with Alidad and Mihail, we're talking about actually changing the direction of the group a little bit, at least for us. I'm going to start to see if we can start to apply some of the things we've learned. So with that, what we're doing is we want to um, put those learnings to use, and we actually want to get some help from you guys as well. So anybody who wants to reach out and be part of that, we're actually having a bit of a workshop next week to figure out what that means. But really what it means is we want to start helping the communities that need uh, help with amplifying how they work or changing how they work. And what that will mean, hopefully, is that we can actually either bring systems thinking to those spaces or connect uh, those um, as communities with people who can help them with that as well. So let us know. Um, we'll probably put something out into the group. Uh, and if you'd like to get involved, we would love to have a bit more horsepower and a bit more help in actually reaching out to those communities. Cool. So who is Andrew Bell, I hear you ask? Well. I won't read through this too much. I was interested to find that he, um, as director of the Samurai Associates, he embraces the, the ideals of the seven samurai, which is to uh, embrace loyalty, honor, and service in the face of adversity. And that this carries through in the work that the um, uh, Samurai Associates do and what they do with organizations as well. Um, Andrew is, or was, sorry, the uh, involved with uh, the Gore, um, company for quite a while, Gore-Tex products, uh, as well as where he's cut his teeth on what, he, what he's doing now. I first came across Andrew uh, when I was at CBA. I was unfortunately one of the coaches who didn't get a chance to actually have, an, have a session with Andrew, but I heard a lot of things secondhand about his great work by uh, some of the people in the call today. Uh, so this is actually my, my first time I'm actually getting to sort of um, yeah, interact with Andrew in, in the full sense, I guess. So it's great to have him here. In that time, uh, Andrew worked with a lot of the executives within CBA, uh, trying to get them to change their, their mindset or shift what they were doing as well. I'll probably let him talk more to that himself. Next slide, please. Um, if you haven't already, uh, jump online and find the Systems at Play uh, videos on YouTube. Uh, a few, few people here will know about this. Obviously, Jean will know about it because Jean's one of the videos there uh, who was helping us explore um, uh, systems dynamics and uh, introduced or, or let a lot of us to actually look at uh, Kumu.io and things like that in terms of what we're, we're doing. Um, but there's a lot of information there, a lot of um, past videos that you can go and explore. Please do so. Um, we will also be publishing um, this video to that space when, when we're done and when we've edited it. 
and put it up there for everybody to see. So please come and have a look at the systems at play space on YouTube. Okay. Next slide, please, Ellie Dad. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Um, before we begin, uh, obviously we're going to record the session, so um, be aware of that. Uh, if you're not speaking, please put yourself on mute. I talk, we talked to Andrew beforehand. He's quite happy with people actually um, asking questions during the presentation piece, which isn't very long. But really, if you can, probably um, save most of your questions for the Q&A at the end. That would be most appreciated. Uh, Andrew doesn't mind people asking questions in context as he's talking, though. Any questions before we begin? Any pauses? No? Okay. Well, with that, we'll turn off our slides and we'll jump over to Andrew and um, uh, take it away, mate. I'm really glad to... Uh, I've really been looking forward to actually hearing this talk. So off you go, mate. Hey, thanks, Dave. And... Um... Hi everyone. Um, when Aladad, I'm going to say, bullied me into doing this, which isn't true, but you know, it's a kind of um, unhelpful way of thinking about it. Um, I was just really unsure what to do. So, um, so where I ended up was um, thinking about what are some of the things over the years of of doing this work that have become heuristics for us in our practice doing this work. Um, there are seven of the, the seven of those that I wanted to share, really as much as anything as a way of prompting a conversation. So my intent's not to talk for too long, but to hopefully um, you know, provide a catalyst for a conversation that we could have together about, um, about doing the work. Um, the kind of subtitle put there, you, you know, elusive things we know but cannot see. There, there's something about, uh, and I think it'll come through in, in these heuristics, that um, I think this work we do is tricky, o obviously. You know, that's the nature of, of complex adaptive systems. Uh, um, and it's easy to kind of get caught ourselves in, in that. And so... Um, you know, hopefully these are uh, things shared not as as truths, but as learnings and, and wonderings and, and curiosities along the way. So, um, as Dave said, ask any questions along the way, but my intent would be to, you know, talk for 15 or 20 minutes um, and then maybe prompt us into, into a dialogue about some of these things. Thanks, Aladad. Um, uh, so the first of these things is, um, and the metaphor is obviously taken from um, from the kind of philosophical concept of our firm, the samurai, the seven samurai, um, you know, uh, butchered into a western by um, by Hollywood. But um, the village is in danger, metaphorically, and uh, I mean we know that um, we know that systems reach equilibrium and at that point of equilibriums where they um, are most at risk of, of disruptive change and my, you know my experience in working with large organizations around the world is we almost ever ever did I just say ever ever never never realize that that's happening um, you know complacency is, is a very powerful force in the organizations and, and we usually don't realize that we are in it. Um, and the point uh, I'm sure which, you know, you're all really familiar with that, you know, it's where you were, Dave, I guess, um, in, in talking about uh, the community, because we, mostly in organizations have incomplete and philosophically misaligned understandings about, you know, change and culture and agency and what those things are and how they work. Um, we, it, it's even more powerful in blinding us to, um, to the risks that are right in front of us usually. Um, so it, it 
you know, when I think about that, as Dave said, you've done a lot of work um, with one of the banks over the years. It's no surprise um, to me, kind of having been in that um, in that system, that you know there's a royal commission into financial services, that there's also a royal commission into aged care, that there's also you know a royal commission into because the nature of these industries is that they get complacent. Homeostasis takes over, the the whole industry trends to. Um, you know the lowest energy cost to maintain the status quo in a, in an environment where the world is changing dramatically around them and you, you get decay natural decay and mostly the leaders in those systems don't realize that that's happening so that's the first thing the village is almost certainly in danger whether that's the organization the industry the team uh, um almost always we don't see the danger that's lurking. So that's the first thing. The second one, the heuristic we'd have is pay attention to containers. And um, the kind of principle under that that we often use or the metaphor we often use is you can only transform a system relative to the energetic container being held for the change or the transformation you want. Um, and and I, um, I'm sure most of us on this call understand what I'm saying there, but in my experience, um, we underestimate most organizations dramatically uh, underestimate the um, the need for the relational and energetic container that it takes to create change in any system. Most of those containers are too porous; they're not held well. Um, uh, you know, they lack the the energy that's required. They lack the the kind of strength of possibility. They get reduced too quickly to to plans and actions. Um, and all of the energy for possibility, which is what really um, captures the attention of humans in a system, it is, um, it is withered away. And so, heuristic two, pay attention to containers. Um, sorry, Andrew. Do you do you mind if folks ask questions as I we go I don't mind along? at all. Okay. I do have a question. <laughs> I um, could you perhaps elaborate just a little bit about what do you mean by container, uh, with few examples and and also um, the en energy within the container that you're referring to. Yeah. Um, sure. So um, containers are obviously a, a, a metaphor, although um, they are close to real constructs often. Uh, um, so we'd say that any, um, and, and I don't want to get into a, we could easily get into a really detailed um, uh, conversation here about boundary conditions of systems, but um, metaphorically, uh, um, I, uh, I'd say that any um, any system or subsystem in an organisation, any uh, team creates a boundary around itself, and that boundary is often an energetic boundary. So one of the one of the things I would often hear in organisations is um, we don't really have a strategy, and then you know senior leaders might say, "Of course we have a strategy. Um, here it is," and they'd hold up the pack of PowerPoint slides. Um, I'm sure you've all had an experience somewhat like this. Uh, um, 
Uh, and, you know, in that instance, I'd say both of those things are probably true. <laughs> a lot of work's gone into creating this, um, this thing. We could argue again, technically, whether it's a strategy or not, but there's a thing there that senior leaders have invested time in and maybe even that had great process. Maybe it's not just senior leaders pushing it down. Maybe it's a really well co-created uh, um, piece, but that strategy will never be able to be executed particularly if it holds risk and choice, uh, unless it's bounded energetically, uh, unless, um, uh, and I'm going to say leaders, and I don't mean hierarchically, but, but leaders of the strategy, people who, who are taking on a, a commitment to, um, to uh, bring it into being, uh, unless they can hold it and enroll people in it, uh, and um, uh, and energize people with the possibility of it, the strategy has no container for action. And I'd say it, it's, you know, it has really weak boundaries. In the same way, um, you know, some, one of the things that happens often in um, the middle of uh, changes in organizations is that that holding energy for the change starts to dissipate because people run out of steam or, or they never really were committed in the first place. Uh, and we would say that, you know, these containers, uh, these metaphorical containers, you know, they're nested. <laughs> There's so, you know, some containers hold other containers uh, um, and those containers hold it, it, um, agents, and exchanges, uh, and they hold difference and sameness. Um, you can, uh, Glenda Oyang has been really kind of influential in, in some of my thinking around this at least, that um, where containers aren't strong enough, they don't have enough energetic um, possibility in them to, to kind of come into being and to, and to sustain effort. So I don't know if that answers the, the question, Aladad. To a degree, yes. But to I'm, a degree. I'm Maybe happy to more for us it. to continue and then we can come back. Great. Should we move on to the next heuristic? Let's go on to the next one. So um, the third is um, you've got to roll ride the creative what we would call the creative roller coaster again a metaphor for the exploration of the unknown if we want to bring newness into the world we will rarely do that by operating in the known and this barrier you know this boundary condition between known and unknown you you know the good and the bad the the light and the dark it has existed you know through through time in memoriam Whenever we we are trying to bring newness, the um, the way to really find that newness is to be begin with a question that lives in the unknown. As soon as we have answers, we close down curiosity and inquiry in organisations. Uh, and, and so part of the art of the deal is being able to hold questions that draw us into the unknown. And of course, going into the unknown is tricky and difficult and full of risk. And you, we only need to kind of go into our mythology and fairy tales to understand that, right? You, you know, when you go on great quests, you have to cross chasms, you have to fight dragons, you have to find your way through the dark forest at night, mm. which is what it's like when you are on creative quests into new possibilities in organizations. Uh, and what tends to happen when we cross the boundary condition between the known and the unknown it is that we personally get rocked by that because the ambiguity uh, coefficient goes up massively. The sense of um, assuredness dissipates, 
and uh, people can lose their sense of centre and uh, and feeling in control. And of course, most organisations uh, uh, exist on the basis of control. Uh, unfortunately, it's part of the problem we have in the world. Uh, and so, what tends to happen is that we want newness in organisations. We want to, uh, you know, go faster, grow more reduce costs but rarely are we prepared to really go into the unknown to find the answers to those things we try and do it from the known which causes us to constantly sub-optimize and the art of riding the creative roller coaster is to really build team this is the only reason we need safety in you know psychological safety and um and real relational connection in organizations, you don't need psychological safety in teams if what you're trying to do is predictable. That's a fairly bold kind of hypothesis, but the reason you need psychological safety in teams is because when you're exploring the unknown, fighting dragons and um, crossing chasms, there's a lot at stake. And when there's a lot at stake, that's when we need um, you know, feedback rich environments, candor, directness, uh, and, you know, really high quotients of support and connection. We don't, we don't really need those things when what we're doing is predictable. Uh, and in fact, if what we're doing is predictable, people tend not to, uh, um, to bring those, um, those things because there's a lot at risk in my vulnerability and my openness and all of those things. And so the heuristic is that if you want newness, you've got to go into the unknown and to go into the unknown, you've got to build teams that are, that are safe, they're clear, you know, they're clear about the question, they, they're committed to finding a breakthrough and recognizing that almost always we verge on breakdown on the pathway to breakthrough. Now, you've almost always got to touch on a, um, a, a disruptive experience. For those of you that are familiar with Kniven, this is the kind of boundary, crossing the boundary condition between the complex and the chaotic, where you deliberately use breakdown chaos which is a transit, transitory state, you deliberately use that breakdown for the newness to um, come into being. When we are in breakdown or close to breakdown, new insights are generated. The, the, our patterning in our consciousness, our patterning in, our, in the way we see the world changes. And it's that repatterning in our own consciousness and perspective taking and understanding co-creatively that um, that breeds the new ideas. Andrew, yeah, um, yeah that, that was very resonant for me, but I have a question. Um, yeah. as, a, as a very experienced consultant who spent many years slaying dragons, is that experience a description of what you're going through or the clients going through or both like both. you know both. you've so even though you've you've slain a, a heck of a lot of dragons you're you you're coming back into the not knowing yes and more. hold hold that question for a moment because it goes directly to um the last heuristic cool uh, um but if uh, if I'm short circuiting that um, when we come back to it, but um, but it's I would say it's absolutely both, because part of what is um, part of what happens is that when the client gets rocky and close to breakdown, uh, unless I can hold a quiet center in that moment uh, and hold them in the tension myself then all of the all of the co-creative energy will dissipate like i've got to be able to hold that container of tension to enable them to see the newness and to and to allow for the newness 
to the emergence of the newness. That's actually what's kind of happening in breakdown, right? Is that you get a repatterning. New connections are formed both in our individual consciousness, but in our collective consciousness. And if I or, or we are getting knocked off center by the team getting knocked off center, then all of the um, co-creative energy dissipates. And so that's the link kind of back to container. You, you know, you got to understand that these, um, it, there's almost nothing more important through these transformational journeys, uh, I'd argue. Uh, um, this is kind of, again, pushing, I'm saying it like it's true. I don't hold this to be true, but it's almost true in my experience. There's, there's almost nothing more important than being able to hold the energetic container on this journey. To, cre to create the team relational orientation that's strong enough to withhold all of the volatility and difficulty and challenge and disruption of, of going deep into the unknown. The relational container's got to be strong enough to um, withstand all of that volatility. Uh, and the container of possibility, <laughs> what we're trying to do has to be strong enough to kind of give us the the impetus to go on that journey together in the first place. I'm looking forward to the conversation at the end. Uh, not, and, not that I disagree, um, but but I, I can see the bit how the bits are coming together. But I have more questions. But I'll hold. Cool, them. great. Um. So let's uh, let's go on, Alibad. Um, uh, so next heuristic, start things well. My experience would be um, most organizations don't do this. Some do this, some never do this. <laughs> some, uh, I've got a couple of clients that use rushing into action like a junkie uses their latest heroin fix, um, where it's much more important to um, just start something. Um, the metaphor I would often uh, talk about here is um, it, it, it is a kind of seasonality metaphor. Uh, um, starting things is like winter. It's a slowing down energy. It, it's a reconnecting energy. It, it's a building uh, um, alignment and connection and preparing. And mostly because we don't do that well, we rework and we duplicate and we, uh, um, you know, we churn and remake decisions and we cost millions and millions of dollars down the, um, you know, down the, the path in some organisations just because we didn't slow down well enough. Uh, and metaphorically, I'd say, if you start things well, you'll almost always, um, you know, kind of get the flourishing that we get in spring. You'll get not just this kind of uh, momentum into high performance, you'll get moments of peak performance, moments of, um, and periods of real flow where we're not doing all that constant realignment because we really grounded into uh, um, what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it. Um, and we took the time to do that well. Um, you get a um, you get an elegance of, of action and momentum. Uh, and of course, we don't we usually don't do this in organisations because it takes time. Because we pretend that alignment's easy, getting alignment on complex change or or. Um, you know, complex projects is one of the most difficult things we do in organisations, I'd say. Um, and it's full of, um, you know, that the alignment process is full of our individual, both aspirations and desires, but also our fears and anxieties and worries and our um, concerns about reputational risk and all of those things that get in the way of us, of our ability to have proper conversations about alignment. Uh, and then, of course, 
there's the individual bit, but there's also the kind of interpersonal bit, which is, uh, you know, our ability to actually have decent conversations with each other, co-creative, collaborative conversations to, to create alignment. Um, uh, and so because all of that takes time and it's difficult, we pretend that we don't have the time and that it's easy, we, um, we mostly, I would argue, don't start things well. Uh, and the writing of the memos, the developing of the OKRs, all of those things is easy. You know, talking about what, where we want to be, that's the easiest thing we do in organisations. But we're starting from here. <laughs> and, and here is full of, you know, complexity, it's messy, it's entangled, which is why you've got to slow down. You've got to understand the landscape and you, you've got to be able to see the first few steps. You've got to be aligned on those first few steps. As, um, as the Japanese say, you, you've got to ski the snow that's in front of you. And of course, as you know, as Myra and Roger say, the process we used to get, future to future get. If we uh, always rush at things, we always get suboptimized results. Uh, so I think that was four. Five is you almost always have everything that you need. I'd argue human systems, uh, uh, any team, any group of people, any human system is a container of infinite possibility. If only we could have the conversations that are opened and held and treasured that possibility that is already in the people that exist in, in that container. Um, so it's really important that we, um, you know, we uh, in the work that we do, but um, we metaphorically for, you know, for each individual is able to stand in my own creative magic. You know, what do I really want here? What's the contribution that only I can make? How can, how can I really find the joyfulness and meaningfulness and, and bring the creativity that only I have to play here? And then when I can ground into that, how do I, how do I help others stand in, in their magic? And of course, because um, what, one of the secrets here, we would argue is that, you know, we're constantly asking people to do more in, in organizations. But I think one of the unlocking secrets is asking people or evoking people, I'd argue, um, to be more, not do more. How on this piece of work can you be your very best self? How, how can you become that um, new version of yourself that you've always dreamed about being? How, how can you unlock in this piece of work, you know, the moments of joy that will really bring you meaning and, and fulfillment? Um, and of course, it's those moments that, um, that actually is what, um, catalyzes creativity and, and breakthrough. I've lost count, but that's either five or six. Uh, this is a, the kind of corollary of, um, of starting things well. Uh, it, it's busyness is some kind of weird. I'm, I'm just old enough. I've just been doing this for long enough, I think, that I can remember when probably early on in my career, when you asked people how they were in organisations, busy wasn't the autonomic response where people would actually tell you how they were rather than how much work that they had on. Um, so something weird has happened something uh inhuman and um kind of disconnected and you know there's not a team in an organization that i'm not working with at the moment that, that's kind of trying to have a conversation to solve their prioritization issue their inability to prioritize as though that's a technical problem to which there's an answer uh, to which my res 
response is always you don't have a prioritization issue you have a fear issue um the it's not that we can't prioritize it's it, it's we're absolutely terrified in organizations these days of focusing and making choices uh, and of course the more you focus <laughs> Uh, the more choiceful we are, the more risk we put into the container. It's much easier to say we're going to we're going to move um, all of these things, these hundred things, a little bit, than say we're going to kind of nail these three things. I'm sort of failing to see the distinction between prioritization and choosing. Sorry, so I missed that. Um, <clears throat> I'm really interested in the fear and the terror, but I'm failing to see the distinction between pro like wouldn't prioritize saying we're going to do this one thing first. Wouldn't that be a cho wouldn't that be focusing and making a choice? Yeah. Uh, and isn't that the same thing as as fairly sharp prioritization? So I'm yeah, I'm the, 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 the kind of slightly nerdy um, yeah uh, distinction I'm making is that the way. I um, I totally, uh, absolutely get and agree with what you're saying. Uh, the the way this manifests in organisations, I think, is we've got these sixty things. How do we prioritise them? Uh, I'd say, just choose the three. Actually, where's where's the value to be created? Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, and then. It, 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 it's about that uh, and that's the issue that we have is that no one well very few people uh, um in uh, in larger organizations particularly this is why startups win right because they um have one or two things that they're focused on doing because they've got an idea <laughs> And, um, you know, most organisations are just stuck in this mire of um, false belief that we've got to do all of these things. Yeah, well, in a startup, the fear points in another direction. It's that fear of running out of runway. Um, yes, but that's a very, that's a very, very different fear than the, yeah. than the fear of um, uh, if I don't hit all of my 42 kpis mm -hmm. i'm um you know my reputation's going to be trashed yes same emotion different and same human emotion different yes context there, there's yes. some really good comments in the chat by the way on this and then the i think we're up to the last one then which is um hone your practice um and this is this is the point back to the earlier conversation we have uh, you know i'd say almost always the time you know a client a ceo a leadership team um is most relying on my support my advice my coaching you know my ability to hold them through a process to create something new it's almost always the time i feel least equipped to um to do that work and um i'm not quite sure why that is um uh, you know i'd have a i'd have a few um hypotheses about that but uh, um but that holds as a as a kind of heuristic for me in my work over the years and um that just means we've got to hone our practice we've just got to get constantly get better and better and see see our work as a practice um and when you think about um what we do as a disciplined practice that's made up of you know skills and rituals and um experiences that you can hone and build mastery of um, and unless we are building 
um, you know, constant improvement and mastery of our work, it's hard to turn up well when, um, when we're most needed, when there's most at stake, when the world needs us most. So those are um, those are seven heuristics. Kind of be keen to have a conversation. Like I said, I don't. Um, I've uh, kind of uh, they're definitely heuristics. I would um, I would rely on um, day to day, week to week. Um, uh, you know, offering them as observations from the field rather than as though they are true. because they're heuristics, they can't be true. They can only be helpful and partially true. <laughs> you can probably kill the slides, Ali, Dad, and we can... Okay. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Andrew. I have a lot of questions, but I think there were um, quite a few, um, lots, of, lots and lots of good conversation in the chat and also some questions. Um, how about we go to the chat and start from the top and start looking at the questions and some of the points that was made. Um, Michal or Dave, can you help with that? Yeah, sure. Um, probably the first thing that um, came up in the chat space uh, was around uh, that, um, uh, are there being a lot at stake? I think, Jane, you you were asking uh, what's at stake if you don't uh, move to a more courageous space, I guess. Or do you want to represent your own your own question there rather than me trying to? No, it was just a comment that, you know, we're damned if we do and damned if we don't because the, the world is moving, okay? And, right. and if we don't move, no, I quite was the thing I saw the other day, uh, Elon Musk says the pace of innovation is the only thing that matters. And if you look at what Tesla's doing, it's obvious that they live that statement day after day. Yeah, yeah. Whether whether they make the right choices or not will be a it will be a different question. But but that's right. Yeah. yeah there we go. I think for for me, Andrew, the question was around, and I don't mean to take up all the questions, obviously, was around the moving into that uh, uncomfortable or, or dangerous space as an intentional move into chaos rather than and what would eventually happen with atrophy, which is an yes. unintentional move into that chaos space. Yes. Is that sort of what you're getting at as well, I think? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, um, I mean, there are all kinds of metaphors and, um, and models and you know science we can um we can use around these things but uh, um you know i'm a big fan of what um what peter drucker said only three things occur naturally in organizations friction confusion and underperformance everything else requires leadership and, and again you know when when i use leadership in that sense when he used leadership in that sense not you know a kind of hierarchical sense of it but um you know you've got to energize the system away from those things um it, it will atrophy and um and we know that that's what happens right we know that's what happens in in complex adaptive systems that you get periods of equilibrium followed by periods of disruption. And it's almost, um, you know, it's really hard for us when we're in the period of equilibrium and particularly in organizations that are honed to maintain and believe that they can control the world to uh, um, maintain that equilibrium. It, it's almost impossible it's not impossible it's almost imp it seems almost impossible from within organizations to see the early signals of the end of the period of equilibrium but of course you know with more discipline and more more mastery of practice you can do that andrew are there are there any well-known companies that you are aware of that have pretty much got them all figured out 
Well, I don't know about all, um, I don't know about all figured out, but um, that is, uh, um, as Dave said, and now that that was prompting me, it, I spent 10 years working at, um, or nearly 10 years, working at WL Gore and Associates, um, makers of Gore-Tex. Uh, um, did they, do they have it all figured out? No, but I, but I, but I do believe really strongly that they built a, a, um, a, a culture and an organisational system that made it um, a, as likely as any <laughs> to withstand all, all of these things. So yeah, I, I um, for those followed. of you that don't know, Gore was founded in the late 50s. Um, Bill Gore was a research chemist at DuPont. He was part of the team of people that um, discovered Teflon um, and was working um, in a, as a research scientist looking at applications for Teflon and was really excited about some of the possible applications. But DuPont weren't really interested in applications. They were just interested in creating more and more Teflon. So Bill left um, kind of at the height of his career, really, and started Gore in the basement of his home with his wife, Eve, and uh, did a thought experiment about when he had been happiest and most fulfilled in his working life. Um, and uh, founded the organization based on that thought, thought experiment. So Gore um, is completely team-based. There are no organizational charts. There are no role descriptions. Um, there's no hierarchy. There's no positional authority in the organization. Um, I often, the metaphor we, um, we would always use is those of you that have seen competition skydiving where um, you know 100 people jump out of planes and they form into a pattern and then they break apart and form into another pattern and then they break apart. That's kind of exactly how Gore works. Um, uh, you know, I, I often describe it as you know agile long before the the manifesto was written. Truly agile. Um, in a way that it's very, very uh, principle based. And so, you know, I'd say, and for a long time, I haven't gone and looked um, recently, but for a long period of time, it, um, if you measure creativity by kind of patents for employee, for a long period of time, it was the most creative organization on the planet. Um, I suspect these days that you know Google or and or Apple may and and or you know Tesla may have kind of gone past that, but um, massively um, high levels of engagement, massively high levels of creativity, um, and able to uh, adjust and move with the ambiguity and the complexity and the change in in the environment around it. So, so in that situation, was there um, uh, a pressure back towards complacency, which needed leadership to prop it up, or was the system, at least in your tenure there, fairly self-sustaining? Uh, um, because there was um, there was a, an orientation, an aspiration, and intent toward for entrepreneurialism in the organization, uh, um, kind of deeply embedded in the culture, replicated through, you know, who was hired. Uh, um, it has an amazing, it has had an amazing ability to adapt to changes in the market and make everything, uh, you know, uh, Gore-Tex jackets and boots, many of you will be familiar, but Gore makes the space suits that astronaut, the, the NASA astronauts wear, they make the filtration systems in clean rooms, they make um, sealants on pipelines that, um, you know, oil and gas pipelines, uh, they make cathodes in batteries, you know, we could go on and on, they make dental floss, 
um, which was a um, byproduct of making the astronaut spacesuits. They make brake, the world's best brake cables on bikes. They make guitar strings. Uh, um, it, it's an amazingly innovative product-based organization. Um, and it just keeps adapting around opportunities in the market. Just, we'll just imagine a, a, just imagine an organization where the employees build a new factory and don't ask anybody for permission. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's exactly what would happen. Sorry, there were a few questions from Joan. She she's been patiently waiting. Um, there were actually two, one from earlier and uh, one recently. John, did you want to jump in and ask your question? Hey, John. Hi, uh, sorry, I'm dialing in from my phone. I've got problems with my Wi-Fi, so I'm not gonna put my video on. Um, the question I asked about this conversation about Gore the Gore, um, context is what's the container there you know your heuristic in the that are around you need that container yeah. i'm very curious as to what what is the container in that context um what does it look like there um so uh, i'd i'd say there are um several nested the first is a really strong uh, uh, cultural organizational container uh, um, uh, that, that's created um, from a set of principles, really, really stringent, uh, I say stringent, but really rigorous um, recruiting uh, um, uh, and a set of values, uh, well, principles, they, they call them about um, autonomy and responsibility. Uh, uh, so there are four principles at Gore, um, fairness, Try and, try and be fair in every single dealing. Um, freedom, we want people to make the people close, every person should feel free to make the decisions they need to make to get the job done. Um, with freedom yep. comes commitment. You've got to do what you say you're going to do. And the fourth principle, which was, um, I think, beautifully insightful um, and, and is what really dissipates hierarchy uh, at Gore is the waterline principle. And, the, and this goes to Jean's the thing about opening a plant. Uh, um, the waterline principle, the metaphor Bill used was a yacht on an ocean um, or on a lake. And he said, anyone should make, feel completely free to make the decisions they need to make uh, above the waterline. But if you're going to make a decision that's that's equivalent to putting a hole in the boat below the waterline, you've got an obligation to consult with other knowledgeable people. Mm, and what's the waterline? Uh, um, the waterline um, in the great way that, you know, the very best principles are non-defined is non-defined, but it's about um, a risk that you wouldn't want to have to deal with by yourself. <laughs> You know, reputational uh -huh. risk, financial risk, uh, of an extent that is, um, you know, beyond the scope of, of you and your team being comfortable with it. Yeah, I mean, I, I love I, I love that because I think you know Ali Dad's question was, what's a practical example of a container? Um, and I think this is a practical example of one. Like I think often very clear boundary rules of engagement in which which provide provide the container for a system to continue self-organize yes and yes. if you can so, get those rules of engagement contracted for and held then that provides a sufficient container totally. um, so that's a nice example and i had i sort of assumed or held a hypothesis there must be some strong rules of engagement that provide that sort of fishnet container. Yeah, so Gore, you've got that provide. macro container, the organizational container, it's really, really strong. Yeah. Um, you know, principles strong, practices strong, uh, um, sustained through, you know, really rigorous recruiting. But then you get these really strong product containers. 
so the way yeah. you know my metaphor about um uh so so the best um way to illustrate is again with an example so the way gore got into the dental floss business i think it might have it might have sold the business but it, it absolutely took off when um it, in the years i was there um the the way there was a byproduct there was a waste product from the making of the spacesuits that we used to make and uh, um uh this guy an engineer in one of the plants said i reckon we can make dental floss out of that and a couple of people kind of said that's crazy and a couple of other people said well what do you reckon and they just went out and did a little bit of market testing and they just started getting more and more excited and in the end they said we're going to give this a go and there was no one um you know who was saying there's no one there to say no but they could you know they started off small and they just kept growing it more and more people got excited about working on it with them and so they drew people towards them and all of a sudden you know a new plant was built to um run the dental floss product um about three years after someone had an idea and you know i can't remember exactly what the, but the plant cost 80 million dollars or something like that um you know that's exactly how it works so you get the you get this um uh, massively strong organizational container for for identity really it's an identity container but you then get these um these kind of tribal containers within that that are all about product and they're totally cross-functional because to make that dental floss you've got to have you know a sales team and an engineering team and a um a team that's going to work out how to solve the science of making the product and um you know marketing folk and uh, and so the, you know that's actually how the organization self-organizes yeah great thank you well, i mean i could have lots of conversation but i see we're at seven o'clock so. <laughs> <laughs> we are uh, we are staying a bit longer for about another um maybe 20 minutes um so if of course you know it's seven and a lot of you at least in sydney um have to get back to your family some of you it's morning some of you it's late night so you're welcome to stay we're gonna hang out for another 20 25 yeah. minutes if you do have to run away, just a reminder that um, Systems at Play is helping to um, uh, bring the work of Marilyn Emery uh, to a uh, session in Canberra to learn about open systems theory. And we'll be sharing more information about how you can join us down in Canberra, if you can make it to Canberra, um, in December. So um, we'll share that with the meetup group uh, so you guys keep in touch with what's happening there too. Okay. Just in case anybody had to run away there. We, we haven't forgotten that we're doing that. We, we've been spending a lot of time trying to organize that. So it will happen. Um, cool. I think, well, Bernie said to run away. She did have an example of that fear uh, that CEOs have um, of making a choice, uh, I guess, between the 100 things. But uh, I think I'll just open it to the floor. I think... Um, Janet also had a good comment there. She's still with us around the difference between priority and choice. Janet, did you want to kind of elaborate on that? Sure, yeah, I, I was listening and I, I know that it was stated in the context of uh, busyness. And so I think that naturally when we talk busyness, we are thinking about prioritization, et cetera, et cetera. But I think for me, the difference between priorities and Priority, prioritize, blah, blah, blah. prioritization does involve making choices, but choices are not all about prioritization. So choices involve a lot more than just what comes first. Choices are a lot about maybe having to make decisions between yeah. equally viable alternatives, um, which in the context in which we all work can actually be very challenging um they're not they're not easy and obvious yeah and that's um that's why i'm increasingly coming to the view that it's as much a fear response as anything because of that complexity because of the 
difficulty in dealing with that uh, um, uncertainty and uh, and the ambiguity inherent in those choices. Uh, um, like I said, I don't. Yeah. It's not. I'm not trying to be. Um, uh, in a way, I'm trying to be a bit provocative uh, about that rather than kind of get into a nerdy distinction of priorities and focus. But it, increasingly, I, I am noticing that the the cultural bias in organisations is to trying to do more, a little bit, do a little bit of lots of things rather than get really clear about what what it is that is going to make the difference uh it was with a client today and they're running their quarterly you know agile planning cycle and it's just i mean you just read the memo and laugh it's crazy you know there are 700 people in this you know function and you can just look at the memo and you know that they can't do it. You know that the memo is overwhelming the system. And so then they go down into, you know, weird rituals of delivery forms and stuff. And, and just the whole system is starting from a point of overwhelm. And, and so all like all the people, all the really, all the really well-intended people can do is say, oh, okay, we'll just add this to the list. And you get these nonsense backlogs of 200. I was with another client last week and, you know, I was with an engineering team. They had 200 things on their back, on their backlog. And you just, just said, tear it up. And they wouldn't tear it up, so I tore it up for them. Um, and at least I felt better. Uh, um, but, you, you know, these things just create cognitive load in the, in the system and, and a lack of focus and a, not all of it, but a lot of it is about my un, our unwillingness to settle on a few things. We try can and I, do everything. Can I jump in? Because I, I have to go. Um, but I think one of the things that really intrigued me, Andrew, was um, I, I'm coming across this exact issue with just about every client. Yeah. I think what... Oh. <laughs> well, we'll wait a little bit until John perhaps join again. But um, while John joining, Martin had a question. Martin, did you want to? Yeah, I can also say, Andrew, it's such a privilege to hear you again. Um, hey, man. How are you? Love. Good to see you. Thanks. Good to see you. Um, and I think you started to answer it um, with regards to um, don't know well well in the system. My question was around starting things well, um, and I think you were talking towards that. There's a lack of focus, um, cognitive overload. But yeah, I was just kind of elaboration on on starting well. It's very uh, um, very so. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, um, so for me, there's some real basics uh, about actually what are we trying to do and why are we trying to do it um then there's some even uh, you, you know you will know i've uh, everyone here i'm looking at right now has had the recent experience of um a project starting and or a you know another cycle starting and many members of the team are unclear why this is important or, or really how it fits in or why this initiative is important. I would argue that um, none of anyone that has that lack of clarity can't do their best work under those conditions. So it's at that level, it's that, but then you've also had the experience I bet where because it was too hard and people were too busy to um, uh, start uh, to kind of come together <laughs> to uh, initiate the thing. And, you, you know, well, and actually those um, people in 
you know, in that other functional, that other team, they're always a bit awkward anyway. And actually we'll just make a start by ourselves. Mm. And you, you've all had that, you know, that's what I mean by starting things. Well, you, you've, you will always get more momentum, <laughs> much more velocity, and you'll get much better, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, total efficiency in the system if you've grounded everyone into what we're trying to do. And that takes time. And we operate under the false belief that there's not time to start things well. I could take you to a client that has in the last two years has burned $180 million because they didn't start things well. I literally mean $180 million in wasted costs because they, they didn't have the right stakeholders in the room that had the right information. That, and so they just were always in the wrong place. And they had to restart the whole program of work three times. That's that's uh, awesome. That that's yeah. kind of you know that's what I mean. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Andrew. Sorry, before the next question, Dave have to go. He's going to join the Meta System of Systems. I do have to go and um, help my my wife get dinner done. Otherwise, hey, brilliant. <laughs> I will have a trophic collapse of the um, <laughs> the wife husband relationship. Yeah, well, that's um. There you go. That's important. Go for it, it mate. Make hey, a choice. Good to see you, Dave. <laughs> Yeah, Dave. Bye, Dave. All right. Um, I'm looking at there were quite a lot of um comments. Was there anyone else who had a question? Please just come off the microphone and just ask your question. Ask your way. Uh, one one intriguing thing you talked about, Andrew, was that the change over time being old enough to remember when it wasn't reflexive to say, oh, I'm terribly busy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wonder if, if you had some comments on, or there's some discussion around what's changed. Ah, oh, yeah, it's a good question. I, I, um, I haven't thought a lot about it, Daniel, but, but I, I, I suspect it's pace of change in the world. Uh, um, and, um, our bias just to adding more into the system rather than stopping, pausing, realigning, uh, and you know, a whole heap of consequential subsystem imperatives about that that you know misaligned incentives. <laughs> it would kind of be where I'd go next. That actually, there's a um, you know, because we try and do too much, we get incentivized for doing too much. And so therefore uh, um, I take on more and more to prove that I can do more uh, um, so that I'm, you know, maximally rewarded. So, so there's a very clear arbitrage to, to do less and then have more success. Yes. So what are the forces that are, that are popping yes. up the, the, that predominant cultural or systemic feature well uh, i'd say a lack of choicefulness um strategically uh, you know uh, my uh, and i'm oversimplifying but you know one of my overwhelming views would be you know most organizational strategies have just got too much in there. they've got more intent than the organization can bear and it's not staged and sequenced well uh, and so people run at it all from the start uh, and we overwhelm the system mm. so yeah so just, just to i don't know throw in one more metaphor yeah yeah, yeah. What, what, what that brings to mind for me is the difference between um a soccer team as played by a bunch of little kids where everyone just is trying to run at the ball and do yeah. everything versus a, a, a more uh, experienced and well-drilled unit. Maybe this, I don't know, maybe this comes back to the leadership point. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and it's hard to kind of, um, I, I mean, I, I do think it is a leadership point, but it's hard to, 
again, I don't, uh, um, I don't mean that in a this elite kind of group of people up here divorced from reality, but that's part of the problem, right? It is that that elite group of people divorced from reality are often the people that are driving the who, um, you know, in most large organisations are incredibly driven. You know, they're in the 1% of the normal distribution at the top end of the distribution who are incredibly driven, incredibly uh, um, uh, focused, have a massive capacity for um, work and they see their organisations through that lens. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they don't realise that most of their organisation is unlike them, not like them. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, um, and so from a start, they're bringing a, you know, a mental model of how people are. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, um, actually, I'd argue people will be more like that if you give them less to do. <laughs> if you don't overwhelm them, if you let them have more autonomy, if you let them have more fulfilment and more joyfulness in their work they'll actually achieve much much more than they do at the moment uh, and they'll achieve it in um you know ways that are uh, um you know, much more productive but because we don't give the give people the time to self-organize and to actually exercise autonomy and um even in most agile transformations that's not the outcome that we get mm -hmm. uh, um and so um, I say even or almost like I'd say or, or every agile transformation that I'm familiar with doesn't achieve that <laughs> uh, um, and so you know we, the kind of we, we, the belief systems of the organisation about people and how it work and how it gets done are really fundamental in this um, I have a thanks Daniel by the way with that question and um, I have a kind of a hard hypothesis about that uh, i'm going to share something um if you don't mind just uh, one of your slides andrew um, um it's the creative roller coaster and i kind of dare to say it's not even maybe not even about creativity um it was a good question andrew because um, maybe in the past the organization didn't need to make those choices those choices was yes. a lot more limited so we didn't have really practice that muscle of making decision and then we were dive it jumped into or pushed into this ocean of what we call VUCA but and then we are still operating with within the known <laughs> yeah. the known ways of operating was do this and do this plan and then the leaders yes. make decisions and that might have worked in when there were very few choices to be made um, but now there are more things and we have to be more choiceful but we haven't we are still operating from a different operating system and that operating system won't um won't allow us to be very effective in this new world um that's kind of how i think about it yeah i, I um i could be right there i always um You know, I'd, I'd love to kind of, I'm a historian by, um, by training and I'd actually love to kind of do the work. It, it does feel like we are in a um, period of compressed change. You know, the world's always been VUCA, I would say. I mean, it's, it's like nonsense that we got to whenever we got to and someone said the world's now VUCA, just, you know, you can go back to any kind of significant period in history where there was uh, um change and it felt kind of like it does now <laughs> if you were if you were there the the thing that does feel different is some acceleration of that uh, um and it does feel like there's a uh, um there are some of these big thematic shifts happening aren't there of um, all the power used to be with the organisations. Uh, a lot of the power now is shifting to consumers. Uh, and so some of these kind of big thematic changes 
um, I absolutely buy Aladad. They create this um, this need for a different dynamic. And maybe from also from a personal perspective, I, I consider, um, you know, now there's a lot of distraction. Um, you know, we have social media, we have, I, I try to avoid for as long as possible to use Instagram or TikTok. I, I've even reduced my Twitter usage. I was a pretty um, addicted to Twitter for a long period of time, but I have significantly reduced that. So I tried to kind of try. I said, all right, let me just test TikTok. And I knew that it's dangerous. And test Instagram real. It can easily, you know, I don't know. You can easily jump into there and never come back. You know, spend hours and hours of nonsense. Yeah. And, well, and because now, they're, now designed, they're, they're designed, designed to do exactly that, that right? right? <laughs> so I think it's not, not, just, not just the choices are more and, and um, there are those thematic shifts. Also, there are organizations who are actively trying to, um, not, not, I'm not saying that's because they're evil or it's just commercial organization, they're looking for profit, but they're actively hooking you into that. And uh, if you're not equipped, um, it could yeah. be very dangerous. Yeah. And I'm not yeah. sure if and you have really exercised that muscle enough. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and for me, that, you know, that is part of this hone your practice. You, it, it, like if you really are going to be, um, you know, have a strong practice, you've got to be able to get that stuff under control. Yeah. Um. So are there, I'm sure that this conversation can go for a lot longer, but it is 7.20. Thank you so much, Andrew. It's the end of a very busy day for you as well. And thank you so much for all of you staying with us. Thanks, Gene, joining that early in the morning. Thanks, Jenna. Thanks, everyone, um, and staying. Is there any kind of final comment, questions, aha moments that anyone wants to share or I want to call it a day? Thank you, Andrew. Hey, thanks, Jane. I love that. Um... Uh, those couple of comments you just made. I didn't realize uh, VW doing nine-year budgets. That's hysterical. <laughs> and, 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 and Tesla doesn't have a budget. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, yeah, old world, new world, isn't it? It's yeah. hysterical. So, take care. Bye. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Thanks Andrew. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Andrew.